The year is 1977, or as we say around here, 46 BT. That's before tab lines, listener. <laughs> At this stage in American history, the outlook for full-flavored beer is dismal. This is the age of rapidly consolidating macro brewers and mass-produced adjunct lockers. Craft brewing isn't called microbrewing at this point, it just isn't really called much anything at all because it barely exists. So American drinkers who want malty, hoppy stuff have no choice but to head underground. In some cases, literally. See, through the end of 1977, US federal law still required excise tax to be collected on fermented malt beverages, even if they were being produced for personal consumption, which effectively banned homebrewing. That doesn't mean people weren't making their own beer, mind you. They, they were in garages and closets and basements and cellars across the country. They were doing it on the slot. This isn't strictly speaking legal, but more importantly, Time Cop, it's holding the beer business back because hobbyists uh, are trying to keep this practice out of the view of Uncle Sam and aren't able to share recipes and know-how with one another as easily as they might have liked. Brewing innovation is happening, but it's going slow. Then, in 1978, a certain peanut farmer from Georgia, John Hancock, an amendment to the federal tax code, allowing home brewers to, you know, emerge from the shadows and hone their beer making skills on the right side of the law. It's not clear whether President Jimmy Carter knew that the stroke of his pen on House Resolution 1337 would set into motion the forces that would eventually lead to the creation of the U.S. craft brewing industry, but that is basically what happened. As one underground brewer after another came out into the light of day and saw people enjoying the unorthodox, flavorful beers that they made, they got to thinking, those people might pay for those beers. And the rest was well, history. Joining Tap Line to help us unpack this history is a man who was brewing in basements since way before old Jimmy Cardigan got involved, Charlie Papazian. He's the founder of both the American Homebrew Association and the Association of Brewers, and he's the author of The Complete Joy of Homebrewing, which is now in its fourth edition and has sold over a million copies worldwide. Charlie is a living legend in the American craft brewing industry, and he was kind enough to come on the show and out of his well-earned retirement to tell us what it was like homebrewing through that heady era. It's Charlie Papazian, it's barely legal homebrewing, it's craft beer's oval office origin story, and it's all right here, right now, on Vine Pairs Tap Lines. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on Tap Lines, Charlie. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, Charlie, where are you joining us from today? Um, I'm in Boulder County, Colorado. And you have long history in Boulder. You are not a newcomer to Boulder like so many people have been over the course of the past couple of years. How long have you, uh, how long have you lived in Boulder? Yeah, I've been here uh, 50 years. Wow, 50 years, man. That's so I've seen a lot of a lot of changes. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. Well, we have you here on Tap Lines today uh, to talk about a significant change, speaking of which. Um, we, you know, as we do here at Tap Lines, we're looking to tell the story of the modern history of beer in America. And, and, you know, when we think about major milestones that sort of unleashed the craft brewing movement in this country and changed the face of American beer, one that sticks out is a pivotal moment that, uh, you not only lived through, but, you know, played a part in ushering into, into being, um, and I'm talking, of course, about Jimmy Carter's uh, decision to sign um, H.R. 1337, which removed a lot of the federal level restrictions on home brewing in America. Um, Charlie, let's start with where you were when you heard the news, maybe. Why don't we start with the very, you know, at the beginning or maybe even before the beginning. Do you, you, you had a career in home brewing prior to... Um, prior to Jimmy Carter's decision to, to, to change the federal government's posture towards homebrewing. Can you tell me a little bit about what you were doing and, and your homebrewing career thus far at that, at that stage? Yeah, I moved to Boulder in the early 70s and uh, ended up getting a, a teacher's job, a job teaching kids. And uh, at the same time, I was uh, talked into by an organization called the Community Free School here in Boulder, Colorado at the time. 
to teach a course in beer making. Log, yeah, I called it Log Boom Brewing. It was a home brewing class. And I did that for 10 years. And over that period of time, there was about a thousand people that took my my class, which I gave out of the house that I was renting at the time. And people would, all kinds of people would come through. And uh, that's where I really learned how to make beer. I, I actually started making beer when I was a college student at the University of Virginia. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that a little later in the program, perhaps, about yeah. what kind of beer that was. <laughs> uh, but that's what I carried over to my move to Colorado. And that's what I started with. And having a class, uh, a small class in the beginning, small classes in the beginning, I, I began experimenting in the class. So it was a learning experience, not only for the people that were taking the class, it was a learning experience for all of us. And we started experimenting with different kinds of malt extracts and specialty grains. And, you know, we didn't have much choice in yeast, but um, the fun part was that <clears throat> we were experimenting with how to enjoy it. And so that was, that was what kept us going. Um, and in the late seventies, I had decided to, with a friend of mine called Charlie Matson, who was one of the people that took my class, um, we decided to start an organization that we called American Home Brewers Association, Zymergy Magazine. And unbeknownst to us, this was, we, you know, we, we were, we came out with our first issue of Zymergy Magazine in nine, December of 1978. But mm -hmm. unbeknownst to us, when we got, had this idea um, to start the publication, we didn't have any idea that uh, changing the or you know legalizing home brewing was in the works. Um, yeah, and uh, we were starting this organization, and we I've been teaching beer making classes um, when home brew was not legal. So, um, but that didn't stop us. Uh, <laughs> we just, we just did what we did and we figured the ATF at the time, BA Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms had better things to do than bust home brewers. Sure. Which, and was, they, the case, which was the and, case. <laughs> and they more or less said as much. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I was reading up on uh, Tom Esatelli's, you know, excellent history of, of craft brewing in this country, the audacity of hops. And he had quoted, um, an ATF agent at the time. I mean, he was obviously referring to, you know, a secondary source in the, in the newspaper or somewhere, but, uh, the ATF, you know, had said that it was a low priority item for us. That was the quote that they gave. And, um, you know, I, I know that that was not, of course, something that they were interested in doing is coming and busting down your door. But I imagine that, it being illegal was maybe still on your mind to some extent, or did that not really factor into your decision to get further into the home brewing practice? Now, th this was in a time that was let's the mid seventies. Let's let's peg it at the mid seventies, and mm. um, a lot of the people that were everybody that was taking the class was was really interested in doing something new, something revolutionary, something themselves, and, and improving the status of beer and making better beer. So, it, you know, the fact that it was illegal was kind of a plus, you know, you know, I, you know, you referred to the legislation that was signed into law as a transportation bill, actually. And, it, and it, there was an amendment in this transportation bill that legalized home brewing on the federal mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, after we, we discovered that this was going to happen, and it did happen. There were comments by some of the people that were taking my class. They're, they basically said, well, I hope it's just as much fun as when it was illegal <laughs> as it's going to be <laughs> when it's legal. <laughs> right. So people, there was a counterculture appeal to this, to this practice before. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And, and I was, you know, I had been featured in many newspaper articles and feature stories in, in the Colorado area. I was, I've been on uh, nightly news uh, casts about this guy in Boulder, Colorado that was teaching people how to make beer and that it was illegal, but, uh, you know, we were doing it anyway. And, you know, but 
you know, I, it really didn't bother me that much. Um, it, it wasn't something that was hanging over us. But, you know, one of the things that did happen with the legalization of home brewing is that it provided a safe harbor for homebrew shops, which mm. they didn't promote themselves as homebrew shops in those days. There were no home brewing, homebrew supply stores. Sure. There were home winemaking supply stores, and they sold this. But if they were going to promote home brewing, which was illegal, they could, they could, they were, they were anxious about losing their business. Sure. That was kind of like uh, at the head shops before marijuana legalization became more widespread, they would have tobacco pipes, right? Those pipes are only for tobacco, not for <laughs> not for anything else. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But the fact that there was home wine fermenting shops, home wine making shops speaks to a holdover from prohibition, if I'm not mistaken, right? Wine was not legislated or restricted in the same home wine production was not restricted in the same way as uh spirits and and beer production so i mean if my history is right i'm i'm re i'm relying on dan okrent's last call uh is the history that i go with for most of my prohibition knowledge but there were wine making you know packets that you know people were getting from california and and you know yeast packets and and uh, grape concentrate packets that they were producing even during prohibition and then after prohibition the law uh, carved out, you know, that practice for home winemaking, but not for home brewing. And so we we find you, a younger Charlie Papazian, in, in the mid-70s, and you're home brewing. You're not too worried about the fact that it exists in this gray area. Um, when you started Zimergy, uh, Zimergy Magazine, um, so you really, you didn't know that there was a legislative effort to reform the laws around home brewing. This was just a serendipitous coincidence that the AHA came to be and the magazine came to be right around the same time that, uh, that, you know, the federal government was, was making that revision. Well, the, the decision to go forward with this whole project was before we knew about the legislation that yeah. was going to change things, but we did feature, uh, we, we found space in the magazine, the very volume one, number one, to uh, put in, uh, there's a pretty detailed story about the legalization of home brewing and who was, who was responsible for it, you know, the senators in California and, and elsewhere that uh, sponsored the amendment. So we did find out about it at kind of at the last minute, and we included the story in the first issue of the magazine. Who was, to your memory, who was the, like, the major, or who were the major, like, political allies of this car, or this little tuck-in in in the transportation bill that got passed? I, I think uh, Alan Cranston, a senator out of California, was pretty right. instrumental. Does that name ring a bell? Were there, yes. were, were there others? Cranston. Yeah. Yeah, there were, there were others. Um, you know, there's, the magazine is about four feet from me. I could look it up for you if you wanted. <laughs> but there, there was uh, another another senator from the mid Midwest that was involved, mm -hmm. um, and you know there were a lot of you know it was politics as usual, sure. and there were some East Coast uh, and West Coast uh, negotiations and discussions, and it, and it got through. And I, from what I understand, it was the winemaking supply stores. Um, that some of the the higher profile uh, people that uh, made it made it happen. Yeah, gotcha. So so it gets passed, and it doesn't mean that all home brewing restrictions have been removed, because of course in the United States, alcohol gets uh, regulated largely at the state level, not at the federal level after prohibition, we all right. learned our lesson about the federal government uh, controlling the alcohol trade. And we said, the American people said, let's give that power back to the states. And we wind up with a 50 state patchwork of alcohol regulations, many of which pertain to home brewing. I know that the AHA, the, the organization that you founded in 1978, would go on under your stewardship many years later to continue to fight the battle at the, at the state level to, to remove restrictions for home brewing. And I think um, you guys, you and your team and the group there uh, wound up accomplishing that midway through uh, this past decade. You know, I think it was 2013, was it? 
I believe so. Is it somewhere at Mississippi and Alabama were the last two states after the last Lado. holdouts? <laughs> <laughs> um, but but that's of course uh, at this point, you know, that's when we're looking at the history where we're at right now. That's way way in the future. I mean, you've you've got you're in 1978, early 1979. Zimmergy Magazine is just you know the first edition. You guys have published the AHA is in its infancy. What happens? From there, what you know, you mentioned that the ability for homebrewing retail to really take root uh, was a key turning point or a key outcome of you know this this changed law. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? What what was the significance there, and what transpired from it? Sure. Well, um, with the legalization, the 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 home wine making stores could call themselves home wine and beer making supply stores, and eventually mm-hmm. home brew shops. And uh, what resulted with that transition was that uh, more people were turned on to the hobby and there was more turnover of ingredients. And subsequently, the ingredients became fresher and there was more variety and more people got into the business and, uh, you know, malt, various Malt extract companies were, were sprang up or began being imported into the United States from the UK, from Ireland, from Germany, from Canada. And um, also, you know, over a period of time, the quality of hops uh, improved dramatically because mm. <laughs> in, the, in the original days, you know, if, if, you, if you, if anyone saw what we were using for hops, they they said, "Where did they come from? A dust on the floor or something?" It was just <laughs> horrible. It was yeah. brown and crumbly. I mean, yeah. it, it, you know, it could have been old cardboard for all we knew. But no that's fresh what made the no, hops in the old days. No fresh hopping. Uh, no fresh hopping in the technique back then. That was not a thing back then. <laughs> yeah, and you uh, know, from from all that, homebrew shops get more popular homebrew clubs started springing up people were sponsored by uh, clubs were sponsored by shops and you know the ch- exchange of information became accelerated and the we all improved our beer what what was going on at that time with regards to the exchange of information this is something that i was really curious about obviously the magazine is a big you know channel through which you're communicating with your your members and with other, you know, other folks who are interested in homebrewing. Um, what were like other media that you were using at the time? I mean, were physical newsletters a thing? Were you guys doing conventions and meetups to exchange ideas? Like what were the dominant methods of that information sharing that you're describing? I mean, this is pre-internet, which, uh, you know, right. uh, I'm, I, I understand that people communicated before the internet. Of course, I'm not a child of the internet. I was born in 88, so I'm not, I'm not, I didn't exist before the internet exists, or I inter- I existed before that. But I'm curious to know. I mean, this is technical stuff. This is important information that really is at the core of homebrewing because it's a technical, you know, it's an art and a science together. How were you communicating that information? Yeah, well, in those days, the seven let's let's just say in the mid seventies, we can progress through the mid eighties and not, and nineties, but mid seventies, there was no dependable quality information about beer and brewing. I mean, if you wanted a book on on the subject, there were a few homebrew books for a couple of bucks you could get, including one of my my original Joy of Brewing, which was pretty pretty basic information. And a lot of the information was based on English homebrewing, which was a whole different uh, circumstance. And yeah, yeah. we wanted to make we wanted to make we didn't want to make cheap beer. We wanted to make good beer. And that was the major difference between the information that existed and the information we wanted. So, and this is something, you know, you were asking uh, in a prior discussion about, you know, what what were some of the fundamental cultural shifts that happened back then that, that really influenced where we are today? And I have to say that because there was no information, we had to rely on our own experiences and we had to share those experiences. And those experiences were successes as well. They were our failures. And we weren't ashamed to to share our failures as well. So the exchange of information was essential for all of us to kind of pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and make better beer. And that, you know, today is called collaboration. In those days, we just 
simply were sharing information. And Zymergy magazine that was that's pu- still published by the American Home Brewers Association mm-hmm. was the only nationally distributed and available uh, communication that kind of connected this very fragile network of people who wanted to make better beer and drink better beer. That was yep. the only thing around in those days. So yep. how do we how do we do that? We met locally. We got on the telephone. We wrote each other letters and notes, <laughs> and we mailed each other things, um, and we read them, and we experimented, and we failed, and, and sometimes we succeeded, and we shared that information. We tasted our beer, and we wondered what we were tasting, and out of that came this whole how do you judge beer th- movement that, that emerged out of the Home Brewers Association. And so that sure. cultural shift is still with us today. I mean, people are still, um, you know, around the world are very impressed. In the early days, they were flabbergasted that people were actually sharing their recipes and sharing their information and how to make beer. And that that kind of translated into the professional microbrewing, tra- craft brewing movement as well. And sure. you, see, you see that a lot of collaboration. And before home brewers and microbrewers and craft brewers existed, none of that existed. Brewers were very secretive. They wouldn't even allow another brewery into the another brewer into their brewery. I mean, mm-hmm. they were so secretive and so scared about trade secrets, which there were no really trade secrets, but there was this mentality <laughs> of, of cutthroat competition and not sharing one iota of information. Yeah. Yeah, well, because, I mean, prior, we're talking post-prohibition here, but pre-craft brewing movement in the U.S., I mean, those it was a, it was a consolidating commodity game. Uh, you know, I, I obviously didn't live through that, but I know my history to some extent, and I've reported, you know, spoke with people who were there for it. And, yeah, you, you make the joke that there were no trade secrets, right? Everyone was playing the same game, light adjunct lager, put it on a refrigerated rail car and get it to as many markets as possible. And, and, the, and, the, and the game was really more about marketing than it was about uh, uh, yeah. you know, the, the, comp- the composition of the liquid, the brewing of the beer itself. So that alone was, I mean, you were pulling against the tide, uh, you and your, and your cohorts, your, uh, your peers at the time in the home brewing community were pulling against the tide just in, with regards to the full flavored liquid that you guys were brewing. I am curious to know, you know, I have so many additional questions here. I'm curious to know when you talk about, uh, like the actual liquid that you were brewing, what were you brewing the most of at that time? Were you doing small batches of every, every different thing? Were you honing in on a particular style? Were you brewing for your own palate, for your friends? Like what was the, what was governing your sort of like exploratory, you know, brewing practice at that time? Yeah. In the earliest of days, it was, you might call it prohibition style home brewing. It was a dump and stir recipe with cans of hop flavored malt extract you got at the supermarket and you you stirred that in with a, a lot of sugar mm. and whatever yeast you could find and hope for the best. No boil. <laughs> um, and it was good enough that we stuck with it. But we once we began exploring and visiting a few breweries and brewers kind of shared their information, there was these things called boiling the wort and adding hops and things like that rather than using just the canned extra hop flavored extra. Right. So right. what were we brewing when we, when, you know, in the, in the, let's say during, during the seventies, we were brewing pale ales, India pale ale. We were brewing English style ales mostly, mm. you know, lagering was not really accessible to us because we didn't have the experience and the ex the ex- expertise to cold cold lager and we didn't have the access to lager yeast right? i was gonna say and you didn't have the and you also didn't have the caves <laughs> you didn't have no, a bigger cave and we didn't you know <laughs> you know who's gonna go out and buy a refrigerator to lager their beer when you didn't have any lager the only thing we had was something that came in a foil package unlabeled foil package called ale yeast you know who right the heck knew what that was right so it was mostly the British. We, we were inspired by the Brits 
you know, their home brewing books and we discovered things like stouts and porters and pale ales and bitters and miles and brown ales. So that's what we were making in those days. And then we began experimenting with things that were in the kitchen, herbs, spices, fruits, honey, brown sugar, uh, kind of, all kinds of con- con- concoctions that in those, day, in those days were considered blasphemous by, by professional brewers. Sure. I mean, it was like, you can't even call that, you're putting honey in your beer, you can't call that beer. Yeah. You know, that was the attitude. And yeah. So, and I think there was a pivotal point, a paradigm shift, when Michael Jackson came out with his book, The World Guide to Beer, around the late 70s, 1978, 79, it was available in, in, the, in the United States. And we discovered Michael Jackson in his book, and he exposed the world of German-style beers and Belgian-style beers and, you know, the history of American-style beers, um, beers from other parts of Europe and Australia, et cetera. And so there was this, you know, you were, you were drooling with, <laughs> thirsting with every page that you, you read in this book. And we, we started tr- trying to figure out, well, how can we possibly make some of these beers? And through people's exper- experiences with traveling and tasting, um, we gained the knowledge to begin making these kinds of beers. Yeah, yeah. Was there a particular recipe or particular beer that you were making at that time that has, in your opinion, withstood the test of time that you're still brewing from time to time? Is there is there one or several of them that that you know you feel like have held up over the years? Um, or all well, of them, maybe. <laughs> there's, there's there's a you know personally, I my brewing my beer tastes evolve and my brewing habits have changed and. My equipment hasn't changed very much. I'm still a very hands-on home brewer. Um, but in the old days, I was making lots of ales, English-style yeah. ales, which I still love. And they're harder to find in, in pubs these days. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's the value of, of home brewing for me these days is I can make the beers that I can't find elsewhere, which is, uh, you know, the porters, the, you know, the stouts, the the english style bitter and mild um, but the things that stood that stood have withstood the test of time have been i think the, the pale ales and the india pale ales mm. um th- those are recipes that we developed in the early days when the only hop that we could get that was unique and fit our home brewing personality was the introduction of cascade hops. Before mm. then, there were no real aromatic hops or, or hops that gave off any kind of aroma. And all of a sudden, when we discovered we could get these, we could get fresh cascade hops, um, we started dry hopping, not in the traditional sense that English brewers would dry, how they would hop, dry hop, but the you know dry hopping in the American way and and making american style pale ales and that's where you get these american style pale ales that, and uh, american style ipas and that all evolved because we really love hops and i think we the home brewers in the united states and the craft brewers in the united states really opened the world to the whole aromatic and flavor experience of hops which didn't yeah. exist back in the back before home brewing took off in this in the mid 70s and early 80s Sure. And now we just take it an American drinker who enters the craft beer, you know, ecosystem or marketplace at any point after, you know, 2012 or so is encountering hoppy beers en masse as a matter of course. I mean, this is just it may be more than any one style. The India Pale Ale, West Coast style India Pale Ale has defined, you know, American craft beer for better or for worse for an entire generation of drinkers. But at the time, that was not the case. It's right. And it's, you know, home brewers and craft brew, American craft brewers have, you know, redefined what an IPA is several many, times. You know, many times over. Yeah, exactly. All kinds of variations. <laughs> and, you know, when I go into a, a pub or a tap room and there's like seven or eight or nine different IPAs and there's not much other choice 
I, I usually, you know, my tastes have drifted towards sessionable beers, uh, beers that I can have a few of and still do other things afterwards. And so I, I migrated to uh, milder beers, English style bitters, and also German style lagers, and which I, which I brew at home. And uh, it just, you know, it's, it's, they're much more sessionable. You, you know, you're not, you don't end up talking about the beer the whole, the whole conversation. You talk sure. about life, which is what, what the social network has always been in pubs, you know, historically. And uh, that's where, there's, you know, beer is different things to different people. And even myself, I, I've evolved. Sure. Charlie, at the time, you know, obviously you didn't know what the American Homebrewing Association was going to turn into. You didn't know that the complete joy of homebrewing, which you've been very modest about, you mentioned in passing, but it's your your book, your, uh, some would call it the definitive text on homebrewing, which has sold well north of a million copies. But at the time it was, you know, you were writing the first edition of it. It's now gone on to be printed four times. You didn't know any of that at the time, but um, you you moved from, you know, like 1978, early 1979, the law changes, you, f- you have formed the AHA, you've launched the magazine, you moved from your homebrewing practice into a life of, you know, what you might call advocacy or, or, uh, or you know, becoming a, a proponent of craft brewing, or excuse me, of homebrewing, and to some extent, craft brewing as well. Your, co- your colleagues or your peers at the time, many of them went on to found breweries that we all, you know, or many of us like know today that had their household names for other reasons. You're a household name in the beer industry because of all of your work with the AHA and with the Brewers Association. But you had, you know, uh, folks in your circle at the time who, who went on to form uh, breweries that, that uh, the American drinking public would know today. Are there? Do you still keep up with with your uh, with your old homebrewing pals, the ones that are still in the game? I'm curious to know what the you mentioned the social network, what the social network looks like now, all these years later. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure what what, what the what the question is, but um, uh, um, well, here let me rephrase it another way. I mean, what were some of the other you know, the brewers that you were homebrewing at the time, what did they go on to do? I mean, I think if I remember correctly, you you may have brewed with uh, with someone who went on to found Wincoop Brewery, went on to found, I think, New Belgium. You brewed with someone who yeah, went on to found yeah, New Belgium. They were, they were all, they were, yeah, there were quite a few, a number of people that took my beer classes that started their own breweries in the Colorado area. New Belgium was one, uh, you know, the people at Wincoop. Uh, the original brewer there took my class. Um, so, uh, you know, things evolve. And, you know, when I travel around, um, I say, you know, when I meet brewers anywhere, they I'd say 95% of the brewers in my, in my past travels always mention that they had their roots in home brewing. Yeah, yeah. They started out home brewing and they evolved to become a professional, whether they were a brewer or an engineer or a marketing person or or a manager. Um, a lot of them started out with with my book, and you know I find that there there's an inordinate for me. It's just an amazing amount of people that are in the profession that started out with my book. And the thing that I tried to instill with people who would read my book was that you know the information had was you know had founding foundation in science good science and the presentation was very practical but also that it was fun and enjoyable like the hobby is an enjoyable so i would say that a lot of people that start out with my book stuck with it a, a, more than you you would expect because you know the in, i instill i try to instill that have fun with this don't you know relax don't worry have a homebrew was the, the 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 motto that encapsulated the 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 culture of you know have fun with this share it with friends get them going um and don't and the other thing i tell people is like don't overcomplicate things you know yeah sure get into the gadgets get into the hops get in the malt and the yeast but don't get to a point where you you leave the hobby because it's gotten so complicated and involved for you yeah um, 
you know, keep it simple, make great beer. And, uh, you know, I still stay in touch with brewers. Um, I go to a local, a few local breweries, tap rooms here in the, in the Boulder County area and mm -hmm. always running into people that I've worked with that I've had beers with before or I've collaborated with. Um, you know, there's always a story to be told and people to meet wherever I go. I, I was recently at a, a conference in Southeast Asia in Thailand, Bangkok, Thailand, and I met people that started out with my book um, that are now managers in Hong Kong or brewing in India or even uh, have a taproom brewery in Thailand. So it's, 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 you know, when, when you're introduced to something that instills, uh, you know, uh, a spirit of, of fun and enjoyment, you stay with it a long time. Yeah. Yeah. What's, you know, as we think about sort of where the craft brewing industry and where the home brewing industry, you know, has gone since the late seventies, early eighties, that period we're talking about, um, it's gone in a million different directions. Of course, we, it's come a long way, as we've mentioned, in terms of you know style, but also you know breadth and depth, uh, and you know in in industry maturation, whatever. Basically, in every regard, um, to the point where you know the average drinker, I think today, the ones that I talk to and I'm out you know reporting, um, don't necessarily make a connection between home brewing and you know the craft beer that they see on supermarket shelves these days. It's become much more of a legitimate, you know, sort of mainstream product. And in one regard, that's great because th that represents a level of success, you know, of getting that adoption. That you know, at the time, you guys that was unheard of. You were kind of just doing this as a fringe thing, right? But on the other hand, it's it's uh, maybe a little bit of a disconnect from from its historical roots, from those roots, you know, of home brewing back uh, in the period that you were you were you know working on it with your friends in the basement in Boulder or in, in Charlottesville when you were there. Um, what's like if you had to tell someone, or you find you find yourself speaking with a with a drinker who has no you know context for that history for that period in the late 70s what's like one thing you'd like people to know about what it was like during that period before craft beer before home brewing was really even a known quantity before it had been codified and and you know turned into this thing that everyone loves i'm curious to know you know what you think gets lost in the conversation or gets overlooked for today's younger drinkers yeah there there's there's no way to 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 impress upon people how difficult it was for mm. to even get people to try craft beer, um, <laughs> microbrewed beer, home brewing. Yeah. I mean, just you know, just the color would turn them off. It would be amber, and they would call sure. it dark. It would have this strange taste that they didn't recognize what it was. So it was no good. But it was the hops that they were tasting. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it was extraordinarily difficult, you know, for getting beer drinkers to try something different. It was ex even harder to get beer distributors to carry your beer. And it was even harder for the distributors to get, if you had craft beer, it was harder for to get retail stores to sell it because nobody had any faith that this so-called trend was going to be long lasting. They yep. said, you know, why do we need another beer? We got Bud Miller and Coors. What, what do we need more for? Well, um, and, and if they're the really idea. special, they had Heineken maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there was the, the, the uh, import section of, of a liquor store or where they sold beer was one refrigerator, glass stored refrigerator with Guinness, <laughs> Heineken, Bex, St. Pauli Girls, and maybe one Mexican beer and yeah, uh, and an Irish stout. Guinness. Harp, yeah, yeah, something, yeah, right, yeah. It, it was, <laughs> or, it was, it was, it was really difficult. And yeah, you know, we've had some difficult times recently. I mean, we've had COVID, and we've had other things to happen, um, recessions and things like that. But not, it was never as difficult as it was back in the eighties. I mean, yeah, COVID it was a challenge. But there was a no, it, even though you didn't know much about the virus in the beginning, you, you, you had beer, you knew how to make it, 
You knew how to adapt your business, maybe. You know, there were options available to you. In the early days, there was no options other than just educating people on what you were doing and why. And here, try this. Yeah, yeah. You're coming from first yeah. principles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a different time. Uh, last question for you, Charlie. But, uh, you know, one of the, when you read the history and or certainly when I do and when I, when I speak with sources, the Jimmy Carter's, you know, decision in 1978, early 1979, um, that removes restrictions on home brewing is often pointed to as, you know, the, in hindsight, the, the moment that launches, you know, the craft brewing movement in earnest in this country. I'm sure. curious as someone, as, as someone like yourself who lived through that period and who was really there, you know, at, at, at ground zero, so to speak, for this entire movement, you know, in founding the AHA and in going on to launch the magazine and, and write the book and, and do all the advocacy, the work that you did. Do you think of that moment that we're discussing? Do you think of that in such a pivotal way? Is there another moment that you think of that it was equally significant but doesn't get as much attention? Like, I'm curious to know how you contextualize this, you know, that decision, Carter's decision in your craft beer history and how significant you think it is? Well, in retrospect, it was quite significant, but at the time it was, we had no idea. It was a blip. Was yeah. <laughs> we had no idea. Yeah. It was like, oh man, they legalized. It's not going to be as much fun anymore. You know, that's, that's, oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we didn't know the implications. We just carried on. But, you know, slowly we realized that, you know, ingredients, fresh ingredients were more available. The hobby expanded. More people got involved. Um, you know, were there, were there moments that, were there other paradigm shifts? I, you know, I think of the time in the probably mid-80s, late 80s, that we were on to something when Miller Brewing Company came out with a stout. Mm. Now, you know, they advertised Miller Lite and then they come out with a stout. It was a short-lived experiment on their part, but that was a pivotal moment for me. And when, when one of the big brewers made a honey beer, you know, it was the big brewers ha that were bashing us in the old days. You can't put honey in beer. That's not beer. And, here, sure. you know, they're they started to make honey beer. They started calling their, you know, making some pale ale type beers. And, and they were, oh, duels. Oh, duels, which is a non-alcoholic beer made by Anheuser-Busch. Originally, yep. oh, duels was a pale ale, an experimental beer that was made in New Hampshire. <laughs> the brewery is that New right? Hampshire. That's right. They made I they came out with and a and a Mertzen, a, Mar, a, a, a Oktoberfest beer. Sure, the old sure. brand still lives on, but it's an, it's non-alcoholic. But it was originally a pale ale, and those little things that happened to, in my mind was like, all right, they're noticing things are going to change. They're changing slowly, but it's happening. And, sure. you know, you, you know, you walk, you know, the great American beer fest. So something I founded in 1982, yep. I've been to every one of them since it's this, uh, you know, it's a measure of an evolution over the many, many years, the kinds of people who would come and the behavior of the people, which is always enthusiastic, but you know, in the early days, it was mostly homebrewers that would come and now mainstream comes and they, people just discover beer because they really understand what this is all about, which yeah. we had no idea that it was going to be so mainstream. And we've lost, like you inferred earlier, you know, you lose some things, you gain other things. Uh, you know, the, the, there's, you know, a lot of craft beer brands are kind of mass produced now. Does that make them better or worse? Well, let the beer drinker decide. I mean, you know, I personally like the, I'll drink a good craft beer, no matter who makes it. But, um, I prefer to visit my local tap rooms in the area, and uh, I love the beers that they make. Or brew it yourself. Or brew it myself, which I brew, still brew pretty regularly, about once a month at least. And 
I got a couple of loggers loggering right now, as well as a, a few ales on tap. Yeah. You think you'll ever give it up? Too much hassle? Just let someone else brew your beer for you? No, I'm not. I don't. I might, but I don't have any intention to because the beers I make are unique enough and delicious enough that uh, can't get them anywhere else except my place. <laughs> Fair enough. Taplines is recorded in Richmond, Virginia, and produced by yours truly and Darby Seaside, who, along with the talented Shane Ferrick, composed our delightful soundtrack. Just listen to it. I also want to give a quick shout out to the entire Vine Pair team, and especially co-founders Adam Teeter and Josh Mallon, Editor-in-Chief Joanna Sherino, Managing Editor Tim McCurdy, and Art Director Danielle Grinberg, who designed our lovely Taplines logo. And of course, a big thank you to you, yes you listener, for spending time with us week in and week out. We literally couldn't do this without you. I'm Dave Infante, and I'll catch you next time.